Welcome back to Memorable Neurology. In two previous videos, we covered the four lobes of the cerebral cortex as well as the limbic system. We'll now go deeper into the brain to talk about the structures that lie underneath the cortex, fittingly called the subcortex. The jobs that these subcortical structures perform are perhaps less sophisticated than the complex decision making and executive functioning done by the cortex. However, what they lack in sophistication, they more than make up for in necessity. Indeed, many of the subcortex's functions are ultimately more important for survival, including things like sleep, hunger, and thirst. As we discuss these regions, you may see the word nucleus pop up from time to time. It's important not to confuse this with the DNA-filled nucleus. In neurology, the term nucleus is used to describe a cluster of neuronal cell bodies that are grouped together and share a similar function. The term nucleus is specifically used for clusters that are located in the central nervous system, while the term ganglion is used to describe similar neuron clusters when they are found in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, on to the specific areas of the subcortex. We're first going to talk about the thalamus. The thalamus acts as a relay station for sensory information by routing sensory neurons traveling from various parts of the body to the appropriate part of the cerebral cortex such as sending information from the body to the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe, visual information from the eyes to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe, and auditory information from the ears to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. In this way, the thalamus acts like your brain's version of a telephone operating switchboard to make sure that relevant sensory information gets where it needs to go. This function is illustrated when damage to the thalamus occurs, as this often produces severe sensory deficits including numbness. You can remember this by thinking that the thalamus is responsible for sensory information. The manner in which afferent neurons pass through the thalamus is neither messy nor disorganized, quite the contrary in fact. Like other parts of the brain, the thalamus is not a single uniform area, but rather consists of specific nuclei where the cell bodies of neurons serving similar purposes have gathered together. We'll go over a few of the most clinically relevant nuclei here. The ventral posterolateral nucleus and the ventro posterior medial nucleus are both involved in relaying sensory information to the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. In particular, the ventro posterolateral nucleus, or VPL, receives sensory information from the arms and legs, which means that neurons coming up from very painful limbs will go through the VPL. In contrast, the ventral posterior medial nucleus receives input from the face and mouth, so a very painful mouth will pass through the VPM. While the ventral posterior lateral and ventral posterior medial nuclei process somatosensory information, two other nuclei in the thalamus process special sensory information from the eyes and ears. The lateral geniculate nucleus is the primary relay center for visual information and is therefore important for checking yourself in the mirror to make sure that you are looking good naked. In contrast, the medial geniculate nucleus serves the same purpose for auditory information and is therefore important for hearing someone making great noise. More than just relaying specific types of sensory information, the thalamus also appears to play a key role in determining a person's overall level of consciousness, awareness, and wakefulness. In cases of severe damage to the thalamus, a permanent state of unresponsiveness known as a coma can result. The epithalamus, which is Greek for above the thalamus, is mostly made up of white matter, although it also contains a teeny tiny little structure known as the pineal gland. The pineal gland helps to secrete the hormone melatonin in response to low light levels at night. This helps to regulate sleep-wake cycles by inducing a tired feeling. Due to its location above a structure known as the vertical gaze center, a tumor of the pineal gland, known as a pineoloma, can cause an inability to move the eyes upward, leading to a state of downward trending eyes, or sunset eyes, known as Paranod Syndrome. You can remember the meaning of Paranod Syndrome by thinking of it whenever you are examining someone whose peering is odd. The hypothalamus, Greek for below the thalamus, is found, well, below the thalamus. It's made up of a collection of nuclei that each perform various activities important for survival, including regulation of body temperature, hunger, thirst, sleep, and interpersonal bonding. In addition, the hypothalamus has direct control over the release of hormones from the pituitary gland, 
which we'll discuss next. We'll go over each of these functions one by one. The first two pairs of nuclei we'll talk about have opposing functions. The anterior hypothalamic nucleus helps to initiate cooling mechanisms such as sweating and panting, which you can remember by thinking of an AC unit cooling down a house on a hot day. In contrast, the posterior hypothalamic nucleus works to heat up the body through shivering and other mechanisms. You can remember this by thinking of the phrase, you've got a hot posterior. The anterior and posterior hypothalamic nuclei together work to regulate body temperature by cooling down and heating up the body, respectively. The second pair of nuclei we will discuss regulate food intake. In particular, the lateral hypothalamic nucleus is responsible for the sensation of hunger, so which you can remember by thinking that the lateral nucleus will make you fatteral. In contrast, the ventromedial nucleus is associated with a feeling of satiety, so eating a ventro meal will make you full. We've already talked about the role of the pineal gland in regulating the sleep-wake cycle, but the hypothalamus plays a role here as well. In particular, the suprachiasmatic nucleus acts as an internal clock that regulates a variety of processes in a consistent 24-hour cycle known as the circadian rhythm. The suprachiasmatic nucleus communicates with other regions of the brain, including the pineal gland, to regulate body temperature and the production of certain hormones according to this daily cycle. To remember the function of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, remember that someone who doesn't get enough sleep is likely to be grumpy. If you get enough sleep, however, you can be charming and chiasmatic or charismatic. Control over thirst and urine production is also located in the hypothalamus. A region known as the supraoptic nucleus produces a hormone called vasopressin that works to maintain fluid balance by decreasing urine volume in the kidneys when the hypothalamus detects that the osmolality of the plasma is too high. In this way, vasopressin has the effect of diluting the blood by retaining more water and thereby lowering concentrations of sodium and other electrolytes. To remember the function of the supraoptic nucleus, think about looking above you, with supra being Latin for over or above, at the clouds to see if it's going to rain, which you can use to associate with water balance. Besides vasopressin, the other hormone that is produced by the hypothalamus is oxytocin. Oxytocin is produced in the paraventricular nucleus and is involved in a variety of situations involving interpersonal bonding and reproduction, including hugging, skin-to-skin -skin contact, sexual activity, and orgasm. In general, release of oxytocin during these events helps to promote trust, generosity, attachment, and other prosocial behaviors. It has specific functions in childbirth as well, as it helps the uterus to contract during birth and stimulates the release of breast milk after birth. You can remember the function of this nucleus by thinking that parental viewing is needed for the mature themes that the paraventricular nucleus is involved in. Finally, the hypothalamus interacts with the pituitary gland to release hormones that govern a variety of processes throughout the body. The pituitary gland is made up of two parts, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. We have already talked about the two hormones, vasopressin and oxytocin, that are produced in the hypothalamus yet are released in the posterior pituitary. In contrast, the hormones released by the anterior pituitary are not made in the hypothalamus. Rather, the hypothalamus releases its own hormones that then diffuse downstream to the pituitary to cause the release of additional hormones from the anterior pituitary. You can remember these hormones using the acronym flat pig, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, prolactin, and growth hormone. While these are not all the nuclei found in the hypothalamus, they are the most well-studied and clinically relevant. Try to remember the six H's of the hypothalamus for hot, hungry, hydrated, hourly, horny, and hormonal. And with that, we're done with another set of mnemonics. Tune in next time to learn about the basal ganglia. And in the meantime, check out the book Memorable Neurology for practice questions and other tools to enhance your study of this material. Good luck.